Had a foot, but teaching a bit. And, mm -hmm. yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, so she has been a wonderful colleague for me. But uh, with, with her, there are two uh, stu uh, students, so, so our students who are presenting with her. So it, it's really a wonderful uh, you know, opportunity for me to hear about this uh, this project because I knew bits and pieces of this project for, for a long time, and it's nice to be able to hear, you know. Um, uh, about it more in, in depth today. So, the, uh, so you see uh, two students' names here, Andriana Kombaru Com and, uh, and Marie Ta Taut. So, so uh, actually I checked with uh, and Andriana, uh, where did we first meet? Because so she, she told me that she arrived here in 2008 and she has never left since then. And she, so she did her BA here, and uh, then she, she did her master's here, yeah? and then she's a PhD student, and just who is just about to finish her PhD. Okay. So, okay, so, <laughs> so she has been working on Hindi, um, but uh, so uh, along with um, so Candy uh, as a founder, Candy. Uh, so let me just introduce all three uh, three people, and then Madi Taut, uh, uh, who is a uh, 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 MA LPD student, and. Uh, and both uh, Marie and uh, so you are Marie and the uh, Candy, the co-founders, then co-founders of the Serenity Project, is that right? Yes, she's always been there. Yeah, and from uh, the beginning. But the, currently, the, the the Marie and the uh, Andriana are the president, co-president. President. So let me just check this right. You are the president, co co-president co of the the Serenity Project. So they have been working on this project for, for quite quite a while, so it will be a wonderful opportunity to hear, hear about it. So yeah, I think we have been looking at the book. So if you have a book in front of you, maybe you take a look and uh, pass it around. So, so it's for you to, to take a look and to, to, to learn more about the project. So, Candy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Noriko, and good afternoon, everyone. It's very nice uh, that you all come uh, to hear about our um, uh, presentation, and we will concentrate this afternoon on uh, the making of the storybook. So the making the storybook is one of the sub-projects of our bigger Sileti project. So we will uh, give you a little bit of uh, context. We will uh, we want to tell you a little bit about Sileti as a language, and then Sileti as a language in London. We'll just give you very very uh, little few markers about uh, the Sileti project itself before we actually start discussing um, the storybook. Uh, and we want to sh uh, dis we want to to present to you uh, well f maybe the, the the steps that uh, we undertook in the editing process. But we want to highlight uh, let's call these learning opportunities maybe. Um, could call these challenges 
uh, that we encountered. Uh, for example, uh, Andriana will talk to you about grammar, and she will illustrate uh, the point that we want to make with one morpheme, the e morpheme, the e morpheme. Marie will talk about uh, learning opportunities uh, with uh, regard to orthography and uh, uh, scripts. And I will conclude with uh, showing, uh, showing you a few of the uh, issues that arose uh, when we actually had, uh, uh, we dealt with an artist uh, making the illustrations for the project. So, the Sileti language, Sileti, uh, belongs to the uh, eastern branch um, of the Indo Aryan subgroup of the Indo European languages. So, if you look at this tree, it looks very nice because Sileti is actually showing on the tree next to Bengali. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Sileti is spoken in Bangladesh and in the diaspora by up to 11 million people. Uh, it has a very, uh, it, it is a very uh, important element in the identity of people in Bangladesh, and I will show you a few maps in Bangladesh, but also in uh, areas of India and Assam. And there is also a very uh, a lively uh, community uh, in diaspora, both in South Asia, uh, in Europe, in Australia, and around the world. So just a few maps to situate um, uh, Silet, I suppose, within um, uh, South Asia, so that um, it is part of Bangladesh, of course. And I, I'm sort of showing you this map because we might think that uh, Silat is spoken. So this is Bangladesh, and uh, sort of surrounded by India, and there is Silat province here. And, and what we want to bring to your attention, in fact, is that Sileti is not spoken only in Bangladesh. It's also spoken in uh, parts of India. So if you look here uh, in uh, pink on this map, it's a bit of a maybe confusing map, but I think it's one of the few maps that we know that actually shows these borders that we want to show you, these boundaries. So in pink are the international borders, so there's India and Bangladesh. In blue is the, area, is the areas where Bengali is spoken as a language, and in red is actually Sileti. And as you see, Sileti is spoken across the border in Assam province of India, for example, uh, and in some of the, um, the valleys over there. So this is actually very important and very relevant uh, for the work that we do in the Sileti project, and maybe it will explain a few of the um, challenges that we encountered. So the Sileti project is not concerned with Sileti as it is spoken in Bangladesh, but rather with Sileti as it is spoken in London. Um, and this is a map showing London and its districts, uh, or boroughs. And uh, the very first thing uh, that I want to point out here is that in green are the areas, so these are these, the sort of inner London boroughs, uh, in many places in London, in the official sort of representations, Bengali and Sileti are sort of put together as one language. So Sileti is not considered to be a separate language. And in fact, it is a very big issue, uh, widely debated, uh, whether uh, uh, Sileti has the, the, the status of a language. So for, you will see what we think about it as we progress in the presentation. Uh, but it is something that is uh, uh, widely debated. And if you uh, encounter people from Bangladesh, everybody will have an opinion about that. So 95% of the UK uh, Bangladeshi community actually come from the province of Silet. Uh, and there's a few more numbers maybe that are relevant. So this shows. Um, uh, the, uh, the, um, out of the 300,000 people in the last uh, census that are uh, uh, come sort of originally from, from Bangladesh, 55% uh, of them live actually in London. So this is just showing again the same uh, inner boroughs where, uh, and this is what we're interested in, Bengali or Sileti are spoken because they are always kept together. Okay. Um, and 22% uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the um, 
22% of the, uh, the community are actually found in, uh, for example, in Tower, Tower Hamlet. And in this map, again, uh, no, these speakers are not, these people are not identified as Sileti speakers, but as Bengali speakers. Um, so if we just, again, to understand a little bit better the community, the people we are working with, um, the earliest migrant, actually, uh, who came to, to, to the UK, they were seamen. Uh, and this, uh, and they, they arrived just after the war, the Second World War. And you might wonder a little bit why uh, people who come from a country that is at the foothills of the Himalaya are actually sea people. Well, uh, we discovered that ourselves, I suppose, but the, 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 um, the valleys of uh, Bangladesh are uh, flooded every year. Uh, during the monsoon so that there is a very uh, long tradition of people being good um, seafaring people or water faring people maybe um, there was a second wave of migration after this this first arrivals who are uh, who actually came as uh, um, family members joining uh, the first the first people who settled um, most, uh, I suppose, uh, interestingly, is that the different towns of Bangladesh have actually different connections with different uh, UK areas. And the families that we work with in Camden, uh, it, which is just here in Camden, they tend to come from uh, Mulvi Bazaar, this one area uh, in, um, in Bangladesh. <coughs> Uh, so, the project itself, we met with uh, Dr. Uh, Mukit Chidori in 2011, and uh, he was at that time the manager of the Sum uh, Suma Community Center. So this is a community center which is about 10 minutes away from here, next to uh, Houston Station. And he explained, uh, or, or rather he expressed his concerns that immigrants um, the new immigrants from Silet to the UK seem to speak a different language uh, to those better established uh, immigrants, and that uh, younger generations were no longer using the heritage language uh, and tend, seem to be becoming much more uh, monolingual in English. He uh, also discussed with us how uh, younger people uh, seem to be under pressure when they are so negotiating their uh, identity, multi multiple, so all multilingual identity. Um, and of course, uh, it is quite natural that language evolves, uh, may have evolved differently in Bangladesh. Uh, as it has uh, here for those who, people who are living in London. Uh, but he was very particularly concerned about the negative experiences of the young people who went to visit their families in Bangladesh, would speak Sileti, but then when, when they spoke Sileti in Bangladesh, they were uh, told that they spoke funny or something like that, which did not make them want to speak very much more Sileti when they were here back in London. So he was, he, he was interested in all, he sort of brought us all these, um, these things to our attention. And then he asked us if we would help in documenting and describing Sileti as it is spoken in Camden, and particularly documenting the language of these elderly speakers who spoke Sileti as Sileti is spoken <laughs> in Camden and not uh, anymore in Bangladesh. We have had support from the linguistics department throughout, and at the time, um, uh, um, Tom Castle was working in the archive, Mike Frangi was teaching the course in field methods, and the three of us uh, decided we'll try and do something uh, that will link up the courses in uh, language doc documentation and description. Uh, but. Uh, we always ran it as, a, as a, an extracurricular, extracurricular activity. So for a few years, we did have consultants in field methods who were Sileti speakers, but we always ran in parallel um, different activities that uh, were open to everyone. So it wasn't, the project has, on, has never been restricted to only students in the uh, MA in language documentation and description. That's never been the idea. So the whole uh, point of the project is to try and do some real work 
uh, documentation work, but it's also been a fantastic opportunity for uh, the, the students to bring along their own knowledge, their own skill, their own experiences, and this is why we've ended up with such uh, rich output. Uh, so we do, uh, th there is, I should mention, a, a sort of another institution, which is the SOAS uh, Sileti Language Society. So this is sort of these, uh, all these societies that are supported by the student union. And the language society uh, actually teaches Sileti uh, for the last two years, at least, uh, in London. So we have, so far, uh, created a dictionary app which you can access. We uh, have put out, uh, we, we, we did have a, an academic conference because we've had fantastic outputs from essays in, uh, for, for example, uh, analysis that have come out of the field methods for uh, students' work in field methods. A few students wrote their dissertation on Sileti and I just felt that this is proper scientific output as far as linguistics uh, description go. So we had the, uh, an academic conference two years ago and we're actually going to have a publication out of that. And the storybook uh, last year, the year before. Uh, there's been a lot, I, I feel I'm a, maybe a little bit unfair when I mention these sort, sort of these outcomes because through the years there's been sort of many smaller sub-projects that may not have uh, such a glamorous, um, uh, yeah, maybe it's not as glamorous to call uh, a, a, a filming people making uh, um, curry and rice and explaining to us all the steps how it should be done. And, and, um, but all of these sub projects all together actually sort of accrue a, a lovely um, amount of work on Sileti. All right, so the community, when we speak about the community, well, we're mainly in our project uh, talking about the people at the Suma Center, and mainly we've worked with sort of three main groups, the women's group. So these are elderly women, and most of them don't speak English, and they meet together to do all kinds of activities and exercise and so on. They've been very supportive of what we do. There is a men's group, they are usually bilingual, but they are not really interested in our Sileti efforts, and some of, that, some of them are actually against us working as we do. And uh, we've worked also with uh, the youth group, which meets uh, later in the afternoons, early evening, and these young people, they usually say that they speak Bengali. Their parents have always told them so. They're mostly unaware that Sileti is a different language, uh, and these are the people uh, who have uh, suffered identity crisis either when they visit families back in Silet or here in London uh, because uh, uh, in uh, some schools, for example, organize Bengali lessons, not realizing that Sileti and Bengali might not be the same thing. And when they have, uh, they attend Bengali lessons, they are usually told that they need to speak properly as if Bengali Silet is not proper language and they should speak. Uh, uh, thank God, they should speak properly. We've also worked with uh, uh, some other organizations, for example, Shantia Boy, which is uh, an SIL uh, uh, group, um, and uh, they, they, they do uh, provide uh, Siloti Nagri lessons, and you learn more about uh, Siloti Nagri, so that if you want to learn how to write using the script that is specific to Siloti, you can go to them and you will learn at the script. So there, we've worked with them. So, the storybook project itself, uh, well, the money, to start with maybe, put that out of the way, we did get funding from the student union, and we also uh, had a campaign, a uh, uh, crowdfunding campaign, uh, one student, I, I think everybody should know that, two years ago, uh, funded his MA by doing crowdfunding. So he told us how to do it, and we collected 2,400 pounds, I think. So that was great. And of course, uh, the whole idea of the book was uh, the conjunction of everyone uh, in the group, but particularly we benefited from uh, one, two of our students who had experience with book publishing, uh, Emily and Daniel. And they are still part of all this, uh, although Emily is somewhere 
between Australia and I don't know where at the moment, and Daniel is in uh, Spain. So the very first stage, and we will discuss these stages uh, uh, as we go through the, the presentation today. So uh, we, uh, the, we use three stories that were recorded and transcribed, sort of this, this material was recorded either during field methods or outside field methods classes. Um, and they were transcribed in the IPA and translated. Then once we'd selected these stories to, to do the storybook, um, we worked with the two authors uh, to do some editing. So that was really moving from the spoken to the written uh, register. We needed to deal with variation and we'll discuss that at length. Andrea and Marie will tell you all about it. And finally, we had to uh, uh, make this into a book. So all kinds of issues with uh, layout and illustrations and we'll discuss that a little bit too. So um, I don't want to, uh, I would rather leave the space, uh, the place now to Andriana. But really, um, we we have these three stories: "Boy Who Cried Tiger." So we, you may recognize that as a very famous uh, fable. So sometimes it's not a tiger; in other places, it could be uh, other kinds of animals. But I think that you're familiar with the story: "Bundle of Sticks and the Wind and the Sun." Um, and so when we edited the story, so we had the recordings, but when we uh, use these stories, we had to uh, first of all sort of do a first editing which meant eliminating repetitions, reordering the text, uh, structuring the text because from the spoken word to the written word, uh, spoken sentences don't come out in the same way that written sentences do. Um, and we had to make decisions about the choice of words, for example, because of course when people speak Sileti, there's a lot of words that are Bengali, and in some cases we were asked to replace some of the words in that were too obviously Bengali, and some, some of the times we had to keep some of these Bengala words. We'll discuss these things, we'll show you some examples. Um, and then the, the whole point is that we are, um, uh, working on a language that is, uh, uh, well, first of all, not considered as a language and has no standard written form, and there is a lot of variation. So, um, of course, variation uh, in pronunciation, uh, variation in the production of uh, grammar. Um, anyway, I don't want to keep speaking because uh, all of this will make so much more sense once you see some examples of the um, challenges that we encountered. So I, la I leave the, the place for Andriana to tell you about the case of the E. So, uh I'll tell you about the little marker in Sileti, the marker E, which uh, raised a lot of questions for us in the process of making the storybook and, and more particularly in the process of editing the storybook because we observed a certain degree of variation between our two authors in their intuitions and in how the marker should be used. Uh, so for us these were big questions of how to deal with variation and uh, how do you choose what to edit and what not to edit and what is our role in the whole process? That was a big, big question for us. Um, so the stories were first uh, recorded, but the text underwent uh, quite a lot of transformation. So what you see in the storybook, the printed text, is not what we originally recorded. Um, and uh, when it comes to this uh, A marker, the transcriptions from the recordings show that in all three stories, this little marker is realized on agents, but not so consistently in the third story, in the third story compared to the other two. Uh, and what struck our interest is that the authors themselves entered into a discussion in how they share different intuitions and how, to, how they use this marker and what they should do about it. And uh, what was even more interesting was that they decided that they would add the marker where it was not originally produced. So in the end we have the printed storybook where all three stories are quite uniform in the patterns uh, they show when it comes to the use of this little marker. 
uh, and although originally they were not so uniform. So I will uh, now walk you through the three stories and I'll show you the distribution of this little marker where it was produced, where it was not produced and the changes that were made. Uh, so the first story is a uh, boy who cried tiger and it's about a little boy who would take the cattle to pasture and in the jungle he yelled the tiger has come, the tiger has come. So you can see in green the tiger and in blue come. So when we had tiger come we didn't have the marker realized. And if you look at the second example Hearing his screaming, the local people would come running with sticks and spares to save him. And in this one we have Man Manush, people, Aita, come. And again, no marker. Moving further in the story, uh, one day while he put the cows to pasture, a tiger really came. So again we have Bag, I say, tiger come, no marker. In four, now we have having come the tiger attacked the boy. And here we see the little marker, which we have lost as agentive, uh, surfacing on the tiger. So tiger attack it do, we get the marker. Uh, so the little boy was screaming a lot, the tiger has come, and this is consistent so far. With come, we never get this little marker. The tiger is eating with all, tiger eat take, we have the, the the marker there on the tiger, and the tiger caught me, helped me. Again, we have bage, catch, take, go. And uh, further on in the story, the village people thought that he always lies and screams and jokes like this, so they don't come to his rescue. Uh, in this, in this little sentence, we have people, and we have the marker realized on them with uh, mind do. So people thought, and we, we have the little marker they realized. So if we could sum up a little bit very quickly, we had the marker Aeon Tiger and people when we had the verbs, verbs like attack, eat, think, but we never got it whether it was a tiger or people with the verb come. Uh, so if we move to the second story, so that was narrated by the same author and uh, the same patterns were there. Uh, Seven just gives you a further example. Um, so this story is about a father who has uh, six sons who would argue a lot. And in order to teach them a lesson, the father tells them, so one day the father told them, you all each bring me a bamboo stick. And we have father said, with uh, say we have the little marker there on father. And in, so if the father instructs them, bring me a stick, they all manage to break, we have little illustrations, so they all manage to break the stick but uh, then he tells them to try to break the whole bundle of sticks and of course they can't do that. So in the end, the father advised them, remember unity is strength. So in the Seleti line we have Bafe, uh, father, give, and we have the little agentive marker there. So if we can quickly wrap up what we observed. So we had two stories which were said by the same author and we saw this little marker realized quite consistently on agents when we had verbs such as hit, uh, attack, hit, eat, catch, thing, give advice, say, never with the verb come. So we had to go beyond the stories because the data was not enough really to make any definite conclusions. So based on the dissertation sessions with uh, this particular consultant and his native speakers' intuitions, it looked like Hindi had a uh, what are, I think, widely called split intransitives. And we discovered that he would put this little marker on all agents of transitive clauses and some intransitive clauses, so verbs such as laugh, jump, dance. Uh, but it would be ungrammatical for him to have it with uh, verbs such as die, fall, grow, and interestingly, come would be thrown in there as well. So that was uh, very nice and it looked very organized and it was very nice. Uh, but <laughs> if we look at the <coughs> third story, uh, it, it gets quite clear that there is much more that you could say about this little marker. So, so this story was narrated by a different author and the examples that I'm giving you now are examples from the unedited 
version of the text. So these are, this is not what you will see in the storybook itself. Uh, so in this one we have, uh, once the wind and the sun were arguing about who was stronger. So we have wind and sun, quarrel do, no marker. Uh, in the second one we have, we have the wind said my strength is small, we will say no mark on wind. Uh, and we have the sun said, no, my strength is more. Again, the sun said, uh, no marker. And when we have the man said, why is it suddenly that very strong wind came? With the man, we had a little marker there. And 13 gives you just a further example with the man. Finally, the man took off his shawl. Oh, um, I've talked about the question of story like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have... Uh, we have a little mark on the man. Um, and at this point we thought that animacy could be at play. I mean, it looks like you could, you could make some sort of argument when it comes to animacy. But if we look at other examples in the story, it, it, it doesn't look so simple. So in 13, we have uh, the wind exhaled wind. And in that case, we get the marker. In the second one, the wind made dust and dirt and the trees leaves, everything fly everywhere. Uh, again, we have it on the wind. But again, with exhale, it's dropped. So in this one, we have wind exhales, wind much more forcefully like a storm. So we have boyar, and we have boyar, sarma, exhaled, no marker, although in 13 we had it. So that wasn't, I mean, you couldn't argue for uh, a split system of some sort, something else seemed to be going on. And um, of course, we had to go beyond the stories again. So we worked with, uh, with, uh, with the lady who narrated these stories, and we found that this optionality, uh, it's not, it's not, it doesn't come up only, only with in inanimates, which is what this story would make you think. The same optionality was there with, with uh, animate NPs. Uh, and uh, this is something that we are working on right now, so I can't give you any very good uh, conclusions and very good analysis. Uh, we are quite certain that context-related factors are at play, uh, but what, what is interesting for us here was that the two speakers did not share the same intuitions. So, um, uh, the, the author of the first Two of the first two stories would treat the marker as obligatory with the, tran with the transitive clauses and some intransitives, where, whereas the second author would treat it as more optional. And what was, I think, most interesting was that the authors themselves picked up on these differences and they themselves uh, discussed what could be done in that case. And in what was decided was to add the mark in the end. And uh, so 16 and 17 show you examples which you can find in the book itself where what you see here, the little marker in yellow was uh, added, although it was not originally produced. And uh, so I think this uh, concludes this little case study, but, uh, and I think it was a very valuable experience for us uh, to be there and to observe the whole discussion and um, to be part of that decision-making process in some way. But um, I think the question that kept going on in our head was what, uh, what is our role in this? Do you make any suggestions? Do you interfere in the discussion? Or are you more of a quiet observant, observer, kind of active listener kind of thing? I think this is a strategy that we preferred not to make any suggestions, not to ask any specific uh, questions about it, but to um, leave it to the intuitions of the authors and how they would like the story to be represented. I think, that, I think we can move to illustration, no, to spelling. So here at SOAS, in our program, we're learning to be documentary linguists, which means that we don't invent data. 
we collect the data and then we analyze it the way we get it. Except um, when we produce something, <laughs> decisions have to be made. And I was extremely uncomfortable with these decisions, but they had to be done. It's been a good learning experience, I suppose. So uh, the first foray into writing Saletti is that we had several options. Um, in the end, we did not do IPA. It breaks the linguist's heart, but it's not practical. Um, we also have the Roman script, in which some people are literate because they know English. This, uh, these are from the Omnibot page, but we did not use that transcription system in Roman. Um, you'll, you'll explain that why. Then there's the Eastern Nagri, or the Bengali script, and then there's the Saloti Nagri script, which is being revitalized. It was used probably from the 16th to the 18th century pretty regularly, depending on a person's literacy. And then it, well, when Bangladesh was created, there were some instances of encouraging it to be no longer used. So it has been used for a couple generations now. And um, in addition to deciding which scripts to use, we had to decide how we were going to use them. Um, I was told that you could not put all four lines on one page, it would not look good. So in the end, our linguistic landscape came about putting Nagri as the Saleti identity in, in the forefront, using the English, the Romans, Roman transcription as a form of aid to help pronunciation, to help learn Saleti, to read Saleti Nagri, and then we put the Eastern Nagri and English translations in the back. The English translation is a true translation. The Eastern Nagri is not a Bengali translation. We transcribed Saleti using a system of, transcri of transcription decided by the authors um, just because I think the authors, again, they, they understood that there was going to be pressure on saying that Saleti is Bengali, and if the Bengali script was just simply standard Bengali, that there would be confusion. So there was, a, there was an effort to differentiate Saleti from Bengali. And uh, there are copies of the books being passed around, if you'd like to have a look at it. Shall I pass that around the other ones as well? Or? Um, have they, have anyone not seen have it? anybody had a chance to look at it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the challenge with the Saloti Nagri is that it hadn't been used in quite a while, um, but it now exists in Unicode, so there is a community of Saloti Nagri users um, that I got most of my data from. <laughs> and you see that these are the old, uh, old, trans old books, and then we've got uh, a Facebook friend who started translating some primers that they used in school in Bangladesh. And Facebook. <laughs> so both of our authors were literate, they're both literate in Eastern Nagri Bengali and in English, the Roman script, but not in the Saloti Nagri. So I had to go and find how to spell all these different words. And we have this wonderful Facebook page that's been great. Um, just that we can go and people contribute with the way they think things should be spelled, the meanings of proper Saleti words, people asking about difference in vocabulary, and then me just saying, I don't understand this, can someone please tell, tell me what it is? So it's, it's a good, um, so Facebook can be used for data collection. Okay, so, <laughs> not only, so before we can actually write the language, we have to work on the orthography. And to work on the orthography, you have to know a little bit about this, how the system of the language works. So, it's, um, Saleti is a typical South Asian language in that it does differentiate between dental and alveolar retroflex plosives. Um, its closest neighbor, Assamese, does not. Um, Saleti does not distinguish between non-aspirated and aspirated consonants, which has been very interesting in the spelling because in South Asian scripts, you have separate letters for both the aspirated and non-aspirated consonants. 
Um, so unlike standard Bengali, this was another challenge to spelling, is that standard Bengali, neutral, standard Bengali neutralized all its sibilants to the post-alveolar sh, whereas the Leti has kept a differentiation between the sibilants s and sh, in addition to adding some more fricatives that standard Bengali doesn't have. Um, again, standard Bengali, standard Bengali has long and short vowels. Saleti and Assamese do not. Assamese still writes them. Saloti Nagri cannot write them because they just have the one diacritic for the vowel. So that's knowing that Saloti Nagri is much more suited for Saleti than the Bengali script, in that 500 years ago, people already recognized that Saleti did not have long and short vowels. And so Saleti has lexical tone, or so I've read, and I now have a long list of homophones that seem to differ by tone. And uh, the hypothesis is that when it lost, uh, when Saleti lost its aspiration, that this a high tone was left over, sort of. Um, and then Saleti has classifiers unique to, to South Asian, to the Eastern branch of South Asian languages, compound postpositions, and it tends to be somewhat, well, Bengali, standard Bengali, tends to be somewhat agglutinating, so they just kind of say things should be one word when I don't see it. <laughs> but, okay. Um, so we have a database of 5,600 entries <coughs> with and next year, almost 2,000 variants. <laughs> so a third of our database is just variants. And that is, and that's a natural language. It's not standardized. People have lots of variation. How do we write this? <laughs> um, a classic example, uh, half the people will say hohol, half the people say hokol. Both are correct. What do we do? <laughs> um, here, in this case, we decided to go with one. Um, but then we can come across things like the emphatic markers, they're both E and U. In the different instances, we kept them, I proposed making them stand, you know, uniform, but no, the, the diactics as well, we've got a couple cases where all of a sudden we have an E instead of an A. I asked if it wanted to be changed, no, it was good the way it was, so we kept that. <laughs> um, so. What's really interesting in this editing process is our two speakers are very intelligent people. They're literate. They have been, they've learned a lot through working with us over the years in that they've, they've trained themselves to identify which language is which, which is usually, it's not a natural situation for multilingual speakers. Um, but the fact that they're literate in other languages doesn't mean they have a sense or an instinct to spell anything in Saleti, which made editing somewhat difficult because I had to almost push and ask a direct question because for them, it just it seemed okay. Informal writing, informal usage. So, okay, here we go. <laughs> so from transcription to written text. Um, originally we presented the stories transcribed. We've got IPA, we've got the Roman alphabet. Um, my attempts at Nagri and my attempts at Eastern, or Saloti Nagri and Eastern Nagri. And then we started going through them. But then we always come up with these, by mixing everything together, pro you know, not problems, <laughs> issues, issues came about. Um, so for example, you do, do we write, so I'm just gonna go really quick, you don't have to understand any of this because I know the scripts are, <laughs> so the first issue, do we always write a g after the velar nasal? In some words we do, in some words we don't. In one word, we do sometimes, and sometimes we don't. Um, this uh, spelling, it seems like um, manus would have been the natural Saleti pronunciation, but the Bengali manush has become uh, more standard, so nobody says manus anymore, they just say manush, which causes a problem when we start using it with phonotactics. <laughs> Um, so what happens is that uh, manush becomes manche, which is classic in, in Saleti, the, um, 
the underlying affricates were fricativized, <laughs> were, were, were weakened to simply se and ze, unless they encounter a dental next to them, and then they'll manifest again as an affricate. So what we have here is unfortunately, how do we spell this word now? That um, in the different scripts, it's not going to work by using one in one language and a different letter in a different script. And then of course, again, we have elated vowels. <laughs> do we write them? Do we not write them? Some say yes, some say no. Um, Again, differences of opinion dropping. Um, do, what do we transcribe if it's transcription, or do we respect a more standard Bengali spelling? That was always debated, where do we st stick something in there or not? Um, here in this transcription of uh, Bishash, it's a more Sanskritic classical word. Um, we tended not to use this letter anywhere else in the transcription except in this word, because if we kept two of these, letters, it just it struck them as not being correct. They, they had their, their habit of seeing a certain spelling a certain way was more, was, it outweighed the logic of the transcription system that, they, that we were developing. But then in Slotinagri, it doesn't have these different letters, so we do have the same letter, twi the same letter twice. And then words. <laughs> um, here we have, uh, we, we have an example of a molachan, which is from a monlachan, which would be a phrase, but it's been condensed. Um, sounds have been dropped. Ela also exists in the story, which Ela is a re very reduced version of a monlachan. Here they say a molachan. Do we write it as one word? Do we try to keep things more regular? What do we do? Um, and then we come to some more phonotactics. In Saleti, the velar plosive is uh, k next to the high vowels, e and u, and ch in the lower vowels, a, o, and a. Um, except when we have it in a geminate. In a geminate, it will still go back to the plosive form. So in an expression, um, so you say ekano. You write, you write an echano. Should it be one word? Should it be two words? They're saying here, yes, it should be one word because of this, this pronunciation change. You say echano for them, it's one word. But then we get to other examples. Echloge, they're saying, yes, it should be one word because it's more of an adverb. Erklage, pronounced elage. No, that should actually be two words. Um, again, between the ita and eta, and there's one person who says he's never even heard it before. <laughs> but our, we, in the end, we respected the author's intuitions. And then again, with the South Asian script, we have conjunct letters. Do we use, the, do we use conjuncts, sticking the two letters together? Do we not? Okay, so that's kind of just a tiny little <laughs> snippet of what we had to deal with with different scripts and different spelling conventions. Um, so just to resume, to, in the end, the use of the Roman script, we mostly copied social media, usage from social media and digital communications. The transcription is on the page in order to help with pronunciation, um, because our book and is most likely available to people here in the UK. This uh, H is written actually with the KH, like the SH is to be SH, um, because this X, nobody notices. nobody knows it outside of IPA, basically. Um, then we had to deal with the affricates CH and J, that become SH and Z. So in the Roman transcription, we have four different letters, where in the Saleti and Eastern Nagar transcriptions, we just have the one, because the speakers know that the letter will change depending on where it is in the word. Um, we did not, so in South Asian languages, they don't have capital and lowercase letters, so we didn't impose that on them. So proper names and beginning sentences don't begin with a capital letter, like they do not begin with any capital letters in South Asian scripts. 
So instead of using diacritics that nobody really uses because you can't use that in social media, we used capital letters to indicate the retroflex sounds. That's mostly for learners. A person who uses social media, they don't type retroflex. They, they, they're familiar enough with the words, they don't need to, to actually spell it properly. Um, and then, of course, no tone is transcribed. Because that just, that wasn't interested anyone in the Roman script. Eastern Nagri script. <laughs> Again, it's used in social media and digital communication in a mixture of ways. Um, it's used between, people use standard Bengali spellings, but then they'll also use a form of transcription, um, informal transcription. Um, so our choice to put the transcription in the back pages was to get, you know, widen the difference between Saleti and Bengali visually. Uh, again, it is a transcription, so it's supposed to help the pronunciation of proper Saleti. I've already watched a few people who speak standard Bengali and no standard Bengali reading the pages and wrinkling their noses because our spellings are so shocking to them. Um, we use the aspirated consonants, so we use the, the letters in the, the Eastern Nagri script to represent the different sounds instead of using them for the standard spellings. So when we have a H, we use the letter that is the aspirated plosive, and we use the PH for the F. Um, we didn't need to use any long vowels, so that was easy enough, and the three siblings weren't needed, so we just picked the one, except in the one case where it didn't look right. And then we had to use the two different ones, two different letters. Um, and then of course, here, the, the, the Africans, uh, Africans were all right because most speakers simply identified these, they transposed the letters from standard Bengali to Saloti Nagri easy enough in their mind that there was no problem with the Africans. And no tone, no tone is transcribed and we did write the elited vowels. Um, and then of course the Saloti Nagri script. Um, there's no standard yet. So most likely we'll get lots of criticism on our spellings, simply because in the end I asked as many people as I could, and people gave differing opinions, and then you had to make a choice. <laughs> I do not like applied linguistics. Um, and what the, strangely enough is people are more accepting to alter the Eastern Nagri script, to write it in, a, to use it in a form of transcription, but they don't want to alter any of the Sloti Nagri script. They really do want to respect some kind of etymology. Um, one of the logics to keep respecting the etymology is they're saying that, well, if you respect etymology, you're writing tone. So all of a sudden, <laughs> now here it, they want to indicate tone in this script, whereas the Eastern Nagri and the Roman script, it wasn't, wasn't an issue. Um, and so I put, here's a chart basically of people who are learning to write Saloti Nagri. It's a chart, just equivalencies between the Eastern Nagri, the Bengali letters, and the Saloti Nagri letters. Except it doesn't work that way. You can't just take a Bengali letter and trans, transliterate it into Saloti Nagri. Saloti has had a separate evolution, Mo mainly it's loss of aspiration, also lost its H's. When it's lost its H's, at a time the Africans were weakening into the sibilants, well, all the sibilants then became the H's. So you, you can't transcribe the, Bem the Bengali word hoiche. Hoiche in Saleti is oise. Okay, and then in the end, in addition to actual spelling, there was, <laughs> you know, What's a word? Do we space it? Do we not space it? Uh, some people say that the, the verbs should be together, other verbs should be apart. Uh, is the negation used as a suffix or is it a separate word? Conjunct letters were confusing and in the end we basically didn't use most of them. Um, and then there's still a domination, even in Eastern Nagri, in Bengali, there's been a domination of Okay. All right, so none of my, well, okay. 
there's been a domination of, um, of English, uh, of punctuation from English. Um, so you do have the Eastern Augury full stop. I'm not sure what this is. I've only seen it ever used in poetry. <laughs> Um, whereas in Saloti Nagri, these are wonderful little images, I'm sorry they didn't come up, but basically you've got four dots, three dots, two dots, and a dot. And I haven't figured out how those are supposed to be used, no one really, no one really knows. And then the question mark again is from English, um, Saloti Nagri did have its own question mark, but it wasn't put into Unicode. Um, and then uh, also an idea with numerals is that, you know, in the end, I guess uh, storybook, illustrated books don't have page numbers, but the question of page numbers came up. Do we use Eastern Nagri numbers? Do we use Roman numbers? Saloti so Nagri numbers weren't an option because they weren't put into Unicode. <coughs> so in the end, um, we're documenting things and we want the data from the speakers. We want to know how they use the language and they use the script. But in the end, they don't always have the option of using everything. And uh, so what's happened as well is there's an extra diacritic that has been added to Sloti Nagri in the Unicode, which didn't exist before, and now people are arguing again how that is supposed to be used. So at the same time that they're arguing that you should not use something because it's not original, they've now got this new element that they're arguing how it should be used because it's now available. So in the end, Make things available, <laughs> make the choice available. You, the choice is more important than anything else. And so our book is an attempt. Many people will have problems with it, but it's a first attempt. And what it is, is it, it'll at least encourage discussion and correction. And so as a documentary linguist, the way I look at orthography, especially today now that we have so much digital communication, is bottom up. Let the people write the way they want to write, give them the, the, the options, they will use the language, they will invent their own spellings, and then record how those are used. We, we don't need the top down saying this is correct, this is how it should be used. Just a few a few words um, before we maybe open and take some of your questions. Uh, I'd like to just report a little bit on some of the issues that actually uh, arose when uh, we, in the making of an illustrated book. Um, so uh, you have the book uh, in your hands and uh, I suppose uh, what we did, uh, we had our uh, funds and we had explained uh, part of our funding uh, with the crowdfunding was that we were going to hire a professional. So what we wanted was to create a professional <coughs> storybook, something um, that uh, the speakers would be proud to show to their children and grandchildren as a, a, book, a storybook in Siletin. So we, uh, we had uh, a professional illustrator submit portfolios and all of us decided together with the people at the community, set, uh, community center who, uh, which artists we wanted to work with. Now, of course, the few issues that I want to raise with you now are issues that uh, 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 pertain to the very first is uh, cultural awareness. So it's not because you are in the middle of London uh, that you will not encounter uh, issues that are actually linked with uh, cultural uh, uh, values and people. So really uh, the three main uh, areas where we uh, say issues that we encountered were issues do, that you can sort of put together on the accuracy, uh, authenticity and the limits of artistic license because if you hire a professional artist, a professional artist is an artist and they want to do what artists do, which is their own creation. So really, uh, eventually you need to wonder who uh, or to discuss who is in control of the message, uh, how much research is needed and who should do the research prior to even starting to do any of the illustrations. And eventually, as well, uh, somebody needs to manage expectations at all levels. So from the speakers, from the project participants, which was all of us, and of course the artists as well. So just look here. Uh, you have the book here, but 
artistic license, but we mean is, and some of the comments we had was, we don't have blue trees. Mm -hmm. uh, it just looks good like this, but uh, things, okay. So let's look at uh, issues that arose with accuracy and authenticity. So we did provide our artist who was not a, a member of Bengali or Sileti community or from Bangladesh. So we showed the picture, we sent big bunch of pictures and so ladies uh, in Bangladesh wear sari and this is the first picture that was produced uh, and the people uh, at the community center really did not like that at all because they said we don't wear this kind of coat why is she dressed like that okay and eventually after much discussion we managed to get the artist to redraw and show us uh, something uh, a dress that looks I mean a uh, piece of uh, dress that looks more like a sari. There was also an issue with uh, showing um, a basket with the tea in the back because uh, it, not everybody picks tea. It's a very sort of specialized and special people uh, do the tea collection and so it wouldn't be uh, likely that any woman would be walking about with a basket full of tea leaves at the back. So there's some sort of exoticism maybe that was at play there. Uh, this uh, issue with the clothing arose uh, here too with the lungi, which is what the men wear, which is sort of a wrapped up piece of material, so it's not a pair of shorts. So this is kind of sort of a little game of find the seven errors, really. Um, so <laughs> some of the things that, uh, again, just discussing again, accuracy and authenticity. So the, the clothing, the, the men wouldn't wear shorts like that. They wear lungis, which looked more like that, so that was corrected. So can you see as well that here, uh, this is the North Wind, uh, not the North Wind, but the Wind and the Sun story. And so they, they, they said, it doesn't make sense that if it's windy and cold, and he's wearing a cape sort of thing, that he's bare-chested. He needs to have a t-shirt on. Makes sense. So they did not like this at all. And, uh, and another question with authenticity, in the story, it is mentioned that he walks on a path. And here there is no path. So we needed a path to, be, to reflect the story as it is told by the speaker. Okay? And finally, there is a huge problem with the hills. But the hills remain as they are. Because if you have traveled in these parts of the world, if you've seen the Himalaya, what people call hills in those places are the biggest mountain you've ever seen. But here they just look like a few little hills with a few little trees on top. Doesn't look like anything in Bangladesh. So they were not very happy with that. But eventually we had to make decisions as what we change, what we don't change, and this remained. But this certainly does not look like a Bangladeshi hill. Okay. Uh, who controls the message? Here is, uh, as you can see, this is from the boy who cried tiger. And uh, because in that story there wasn't all that many women heroes, the artist decided the women were going to participate in the chase. But of course, the people are the, the authors and the people at the community center to whom we showed the pictures originally, they said, woman will not, first of all, she's wearing her frock, um, <laughs> and second, <laughs> um, you see, she, she also changed the, the, the short sort of things that they, that they had originally on the man for the lungis, but women would not take part in the chase to, you know, in a hunt for a tiger, nor would the kids. Not crazy, you know? Leave the kids at home when you're going to hunt tigers. So we did need to, we did like maybe we wanted to be politically correct, we wanted women to participate in things, but this does not respect uh, how things are done actually uh, re in reality. So this is just uh, uh, sort of bringing to your attention a few of the issues. Uh, it was difficult to, uh, um, it was difficult to. Um, to respect everybody, I suppose, respect the, the authors who, has, who have given us the stories, respect the people at the community center who wanted to have a book that would represent them, and of course, respect the artist who was creating 
actually, which is like what has come at the end has, uh, has come out as a really beautiful book. So all of this needed to be negotiated, and some of it with a lot of smiles, and some of it with forced smiles at times. So this sort of concludes our presentation. I hope we have uh, convinced you uh, that uh, the exercise of making a storybook is certainly very worthwhile because the nice thing now that we've gone through all of these steps and that the book exists, uh, the speakers are actually very happy um, to have this book. As Marie and Andriana have said, there will be, and there are a lot of discussions, there are a lot of comments. People don't agree with everything that is presented and how we've presented it, but on the whole, they really are very happy to see the result of the, of the storybook. Um, and I suppose the very last word is that if ever you imagine that making a storybook is taking a story that you've recorded and putting it in a book, brace yourself. <laughs> there is a lot more to it. Thank you. presentation at the same time very overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we have plenty of time for questions. But may I ask the first question? So you described the, the your approach I mean to, to publish that so your uh, Marie said this is the first attempt. Okay? So my question is will there, will there be a second attempt? One day. Funding. Oh. Yes. <laughs> you can do another crowdfunding, I think. Pro projects need funding, and so if you ever participate in any project like this as well, funding is another thing you have to learn how to do. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people in the audience, and uh, you know, so. It's a, I think it's funding, but one aspect of all of this that has been absolutely amazing is the dedication of all the team. Because uh, when I tell you, Emily, the students who were part of the project were doing the MA not last year, the year before. So they do their MA, like we've had Marie staying, Andriana staying because they've started with the project and have continued studying here, but many students do their MA 12 months ago. But we have these group discussions with people who are one in Spain, one in Japan, one in uh, uh, wherever Emily happens to be. All of the, the you know, Jean has, was doing work in New Caledonia. I mean, all of them have gone on to, do, to live their lives. And, um, and it, they have continued being dedicated to the project. So I think that is an amazing realization from the students, actually. So that's, uh, I mean, a commitment. Oh, very nice. Yeah, it's very nice. And if I can add, I think the reason there is this commitment is because it has been an enriching experience. It's not just writing an essay for a course. We're actually doing something mm -hmm. and, and living real experiences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> um, did you agree to do it for free? Or uh, we? Did, yeah. I mean, <laughs> did you? I mean, did you consider selling it? Or was that something the community didn't want to happen? Or did they want to? The our initial um, production. Uh, strategy is that it would probably be unethical to sell it at the moment. We did compensate our authors for their time with the editing process, but uh, the fact that we did crowdfunding and the fact that we said it was going to be for the community, um, it wouldn't be ethical to sell it at the moment. There has been some talk about maybe doing a second run on some kind of paper printing or something like that, but at the moment, no, it was done for the community, funded by the community, so we're not selling it. It's not ethical at the moment to sell it. How Wait. many did you publish? How many, how many copies? Uh, took a little over a thousand pounds for 250 copies. And these are to be distributed. I mean, we've, we've done that to schools, community centers, people who are interested in the selective. We have colleagues in Sunderland, for example, who asked us for some copies. So it's really meant to be a community-oriented needs. Um, but we have many requests, so <laughs> this is why we need to discuss what 
So of course, when we did the crowdfunding uh, uh, bid, it was not to be sold. So we need to be true to this. Um, and then, but there, we've had a lot of discussions. But I'm not sure where we're going with all that. But yeah. it may seem expensive, five six pounds per book that we have printed. But then I guess in a, a smaller run, this. You know, the fewer copies you print, the more each copy will cost. So we did with, we made as many as we could with the money we had, budgeting. And we chose a, a, a printer <laughs> who specializes in publishing uh, materials in Welsh. So try to become consistent in our values. Um, what's happening to the books? Can you say a little bit more about what I, uh, you said you you gave community centres or some schools? What do they do with the book? Would you know? That will be very interesting to find out. So, <laughs> so I mean, going to the community centre and distributing the first copies of the book, it was just interesting to sit there and watch people how they interacted with the book. Like I said, um, certain people just flipped right away to the back because. They were literate in the Mughali scripts and they scrunched their nose up at these weird you know, transcription spellings. Um, there were a couple of women in the women's group who did know Nagri, so that was, that was interesting. Um, but they weren't too interested there at the time. They just kind of, so, but people took it. So that was, the, I was, at least people are taking it. In, in the end, the worst thing that could happen is that nobody would want it. So people are taking it. People are, seem to appreciate it at the moment. What they do with it, what people will decide to do with it, will be interesting to observe. I'd be very, very interested in, in that. So, like for example, you talked about how young children do not learn, uh, are not inter interested in learning serenity, and uh, uh, and also uh, they did some some didn't even know that, that it's a different language from Bengali. Mm. So I would be very much interested to know. Uh, if their you know, attitude towards their language changed, or if any young people are interested in learning it and such. Dissertation topic. <laughs> so, that, so, so then, then I, I was also interested in you know, your, uh, um, the Serenity Language Society that Mary is uh, chairing. So, is there, you know, so I, I wonder who are participating and uh, if any of those people are young, Serenity. Um, yes. <laughs> have they looked at the book? And if they no, um, so we've, we've, not start, so we've not started the language lessons yet this year, most likely it will be term two. Um, but in the past years, uh, there's people who have either interest in South Asian languages and their free language lessons, which aren't really included in courses uh, anymore here at SOAS, unfortunately. Um, community members, elder, more, so it's not just mm. students here at SOAS, there are 50, 60 year olds who have come to the lessons to see what's going on, to, to understand. Um, some are not so interested because we do start from the very beginning each time. We've had uh, partners, significant others of Saleti speakers attend the lessons. And so they're, they have personal interest in learning. And again, it's been very interesting foray into uh, applied linguistics and curriculum development in that you know we've, we've worked with uh, two main teachers um, from the community center and then we've tried to find teachers here at SOAS. Unfortunately, usually it's not been very successful with SOAS students as teachers because deadlines arrive and they can't teach lessons. So that's not been so successful. <laughs> but just to have the, the pe uh, different people coming with different ideas and especially the SOAS students their first idea of a standardization of their spoken language, which has been just informal to them, and watching them kind of try to negotiate that and limit their usage to some teach. I mean, so when you teach a language, you can't just speak naturally. You have to reduce uh, what you say to the, the structures that you're focusing on, what they've already learned. So that's been interesting. So you can use the book too. To, uh, well, um, so, uh, I'll, I'll, so on December 5th, Tuesday, from 6.30 until 8, I believe it is, uh, room, I don't know the room number yet, <laughs> but um, 
we're having actually, it's a, so to do something this first term, we're doing a Sloti Language Society uh, introduction to Sloti Nagri meeting. So anybody who's interested in South Asian languages, anybody who's interested in scripts, anybody, you know, that's, please come along. And we'll be looking at the book at that time. We're going to have to read, you know, write your name and in Sloti Nagri, all the classics. It seems, it seems actually that, I'm not sure if it's, again, that need, it needs maybe to be uh, uh, thought through a little bit more, but it seems that uh, when we, uh, you see, the, I'm not sure if I'm just talking about my own ignorance here, but when we started, it was very clear that, say, in London, people just talked about Bengali. And uh, we've had a few people who have come to see us, partners, for example, from King's College, a young uh, researcher who works on um, emergency <laughs> messages, like a warning for extreme temperature, for example. So he sort of does this course analysis things, but he's interested, he works closely with some government bodies who issue this like health warning if you're old, don't go out, it's too hot today, that kind of thing. And the, the kind of work that he does he is aware that, the, for example, the government uh, um, publications are, are in Bengali, but people speak Sileti. He is aware that Sileti and Bengali are different languages, and he's very interested in learning Sileti. So there are uh, movements uh, towards a better awareness of uh, the linguistic uh, landscape that is much more complex than many people imagine. I'm not sure if we are contributing to this, but certainly I think that over the last four or five years, more people are coming up discussing these things. And I think with the, with the, the story, but maybe we should have started saying that it's one of the, the speaker who has been a consultant uh, for a long time, who kind of planted the idea when she told us, well, you know, the, her children, she had little kids, they have lovely storybooks in English when they go to school. They have storybooks in Bengali, but there is never anything in Sileti. They just don't think that it's possible. So I think that's what planted the idea, actually, in the very first place. So maybe people who want to share more with the, the younger generations will have this, the one storybook, so far. Not sure. If it will really happen, <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. So, I'm, yeah. I'm curious in, in the process of working in the project and observing different things. Have you, what is your, your reflection on standardization? Because you know, it comes through quite a bit, and you said the old texts aren't standardized. Mm -hmm. Presumably, social media texts aren't standardized. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, standardization comes in with a very heavy sociological price. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I can see why you want to do what you're doing, but then stepping back and thinking, what is it that we're doing? Um, I'm curious what, what you have, you entered into the community view of this. Andriana, you start, I think. Hello, Andriana, for example, with your little heat. I mean, I mean, I can see why you want an analysis of this beautiful analysis, of course, of two texts doesn't work for the third text, I'm sure there's a reason, but, but that's the linguistic interest that yeah. I can share the passion for that. Mm -hmm. But in a text, you know, whether there's a random E at the end of a word or not, I should be care. I'm not sure. I, I had a lot of questions during, because I happened to uh, observe this whole decision-making process, and for me, I had the purely linguistic interests. Uh, as you said, whether this air was there or was not there, it was not that interesting for me. But at the same time, uh, while all the decisions were being made, I always was thinking, should I interfere? Like, should I make a suggestion? Should I just let the speakers decide what they want? Uh, which in the end is what we, what we chose to do. Uh, but through the whole time, I felt quite a bit sad that the stories were getting stripped from their richness so it was not a, it was it was a very tricky situation to be so, you, so. writing is a reduction of language it's this language in a reduced form so there is a pressure to create something 
in this reduced form. In the end, so in the end, we are doing something as we're serving as a platform for questions. So the fact that nobody's really been out there asking these questions about Saleti, nobody's considered that Saleti is a language. And I know that the fact that we're associated with the university, there's prestige involved. And the fact that we're asking, if, so it's not some, I mean, the horror of having to decide on spelling, that was, <laughs> I, it was very difficult. Emotionally difficult as well. My database, I'm proud of its of its of its diversity, and I'm proud that on the, the Facebook pages that we encourage this diversity. But but it's asking those questions, having somebody ask the questions that as well. It, it's important. And so we, I you know, should we or shouldn't we? But my personal passion comes from my interest and the fact that I'm asking the questions, and then just standing back and just kind of taking in the answers. I suppose it's a more anthropological way of doing things, but the fact that the questions are being asked is important in the end. Are there any, um, do you have any links to select to the Bangladesh uh, region how do they view what they, what you're doing here? Do they? I, I assume they have discussed the very same issues because they like they also encountered difficulties in writing down in their language or using the scripts. Come and check out the Facebook page and see many different. So we just got, I mean, spelling is actually quite emotional. People get very enthusiastic and develop strong opinions. Um, so it's like. It's quite difficult actually because I'm not sure how many people are aware of the Celeti project in Bangladesh. We do have uh, connections with some people who have been working in Bangladesh for a long, long time. Uh, also, the, the, con the political context in Bangladesh is very, very different. So I'm not sure that uh, because, because Bengali has, is extremely important in the national uh, history and the national identity. Um, so. The discussions that we have are a lot uh, with people in the diaspora, actually. Um, and I think that for many, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm right, but I think that for people in, in Bangladesh, in Silla province, those who start writing write in Bengali. Um, St standard education is yeah. in standard Bengali. So I'm not sure if these questions are really um, that relevant for them, although there is uh, uh, an interest in the Silati Nagri script, which is taking place. Um, Interesting enough, the, the current impetus of the revitalization of the script is, um, happened because of Assam. In Assam, the Indian government started questioning some of the um, land deeds, and these land deeds were actually written in Silati Nagri script. Um, so people in Assam, India, mm -hmm. had to start kind of pushing to have Slotinag recognized. And at that time, SIL had already published their Bible, and they had Unicode, you know, their, their Unicode, SIL did the Unicode pop, uh, proposal. Um, so thank you, SIL, it's <laughs> really are beneficial in some way. <laughs> um, but, uh, mo most of the people on the Facebook, about half and half, half are Bangladeshis interested in finding a forum that they can speak about Saleti as a language and the Facebook group. You'll notice almost all Facebook groups on, most of the groups, social media groups are closed groups because there is, there are many people out there who are quite negative against any effort of Saleti being a language. Yeah, you just mentioned the um, revitalization of the Dwati um, I was going to ask you about that, um, sort of by whom and how extensive are these revitalization efforts? And was there some kind of dialogue there that you guys could work with in your, um, your, your transcription? So, um, <laughs> the, the page, the, 
Facebook, isn't it? Yeah, it's most of us. So I, I first started learning Sloti Nagra at Shantir Boy, which is the bookshop um, just off Brick Lane. Uh, so it's a Christian, it's a faith oriented bookshop <coughs> associated with the SIL people. They sell the Bible, the New Testament, both in, in Saleti, in the Eastern Nagri, and in the Sloti Nagri script, which explains why there's some weird things in their Unicode proposal. Because they, I think they did what a machine uh, transition from Eastern Nagri to Saloti Nagri instead of going through and transcribing, writing everything, typing everything again. Um, so I learned it there. They do have teaching material that they've been working on for, I'd say, about 20 years now. So there, in London, at least, within the diaspora community, there has been interest in Saloti Nagri for uh, quite a few years. That interest has just never blown up, I suppose, before. But now that the Unicode exists, and like I said, Facebook is now supporting it. Um, if you've installed the font into your computer, you can actually see the, instead of, you know, I don't know what happened the here. <laughs> so, um, you know, and this is exported as a PDF on my, from my laptop, so it should have come up. <laughs> um, so again, I mean, but it's in, it's in Unicode, and that's like a step to modernization, that it can be used. I wonder how many people from the community did you involve during the editing process? <laughs> uh, well, for the grammar, for the actual text, just the authors. Um, in fact, the two authors. The two authors. In fact, when I, when I sent the completed text to various people for them to give feedback on spelling, especially Sophie mm -hmm. Nagri spelling, some of them also gave grammar feedback. We didn't take any of that. I mean, it's, it's saved somewhere, but the text are the original text by the authors. So that, that's the way the authors wanted them to be, and that's. But there was with like the case marking, there was negotiation between the two of them because we we did the editing with both of them together. Uh, and the story is all at the same time. I was just wondering because we had a similar case in Thailand. I mean, um, we have these migrants uh, moving to Thailand, and they're actually from the same district but different villages, and then we had the same problem with standardization. And so we just wonder I mean, it's a methodological concern that we have to think if we should go you know, towards standardization or should we should maybe this is going to be, I mean, this is the language that they speak. It's okay to be different, or whether we should yeah. try to make it more standardized. Well, definitely the variation that we that we observe is sort of, sort of one author has lived in the UK for a long time is a man. Younger, the other author grew up in uh, in Bang Bangladesh, arrived here, so she's a woman. Younger, so there's an age, gender, <laughs> uh, uh, life experience, and. Um, there's regional variation as well. So all of this together makes for a certain amount of variation. And there seem to be differences between male and female. Um, um, it's not it's lots of variation, I mean, between age, between geographical regions, between sexes. Uh, like they didn't, I mean, we did start off with of ver versions of the stories that were, produ were produced by each of them individually. And then it's true that editing, maybe, maybe things would have turned out differently if we just worked on each author's story and then in the end we decided to which, what to uniformize and what not to, but then would that be ethical? Mm. Perhaps we can talk to other members of the community and see what they have to say about these stories. Well, yeah, and I think our our view is that this is a this is our like our uh, first book. Um, it's not as if it's really possible for us to so, to standardize, make all these decisions about standardizing the language. I think our our view of our role is that we we listen, we we ask questions. Uh, but at the end, the standardization uh, process is much longer and would need a lot more people involved, obviously. So I'm sure you have lots yeah. more questions, and but, uh, uh, I think we need to finish here. But uh, you, you can go to the IOE pub afterwards. Of course. So, so if those who have <laughs> questions, please come join us at the IOE pub. Uh, in a few, few minutes, I maybe, in 15 minutes more. So thank you very much.